Uh, so right now we're going to have um, a time of prayer, a uh, special prayer. Um, and uh, before we, uh, we do pray uh, for all of our needs and all of our uh, problems and all of our uh, frustrations in life. I would like to read a couple of verses. Um, you know, Bible is uh, is a book, is a special book. It's a book of promises. There is, uh, uh, if you go to an Adventist book center or uh, any uh, bookstore, you'll find um, a lot of um, you'll find a lot of uh, small little books of promises. They're uh, little books filled of with verses from the Bible um, of all of the promises that God has uh, given to us through his word. And um, today I'd like to read a couple of those promises. First uh, verse I'd like to read from Matthew 11, uh, 28. And this is the verse that we actually read today during the Sabbath school. But uh, it says, Come to me, all who are weary and hev heavily laden, uh, and I will give you rest. Uh, you know, God is telling us through this uh, through this scripture, come to me all. Come to me all of you who are weary, who with all of your problems, with all of your issues, with all of your um, heavy heart, come to me and, and I will make it. I will take it off. I will take that load off and I will make sure and I will help you with everything. Um, another promise um, that we hear is... Um, from Isaiah uh, chapter 41 verse 10 um, do not fear for I am with you do not anxiously look about you for I am your God I will strengthen you surely I will help you surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand um, there is the the phrase do not fear um, in the Bible, it repeats over 360 times. Um, there's five days in a year. There is a, a phrase, do not fear, for every day of the year. So today, if you are afraid of something, if there's something terrible going on in your life, if there's something that is really heavy on your heart, um, there's something that uh, maybe burdens your heart today, um, remember this verse, do not fear. Remember this phrase, do not fear because that's that's what God is telling you each and every day do not fear do not be afraid of anything and today um, I would like to obviously um, we're not going to be able to kneel here but um, if we can all stand and um, have one prayer um, and um, ask God for uh, for his blessing uh, for today's worship our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. We thank you so much for this um, this place in the middle of nature, in the middle of your creation, where we can be uh, together worshiping you in, in our song, worshiping you in our prayers. We thank you so much for all of the prayers that you've given us in your word uh, that we can use in our lives the problems, all of the issues, all of the um, heavy burdens that we have on our hearts. And today we bring them to you. You know all the people that are maybe sick, um, maybe are out of work today because of this COVID-19. Um, you know, everything uh, that is going on in uh, among your, your people. And today we ask you that you uh, guide us, you be with us. And really trust you and not be afraid uh, because you promised that you're always going to be with us. Um, bless us today as we worship you, as we continue to worship. Um, bless uh, our brother who's going to be preaching to us. Um, help his word to really touch our heart today and um, make us whole. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to read a little something for the offertory right now. Uh, begin by helping your neighbors. Every church member should feel, his speci should feel it his special duty to labor for those living in his neighborhood. Study how you can best help those who take no interest in religious things. 
as you visit your friends and neighbors, show an interest in their spiritual as well as in their temporal welfare. Present Christ as a sin-pardoning Savior. Invite your neighbors to your home and read with them from the precious Bible and from books that explain its truth. This wonderful counsel can be found in the book Welfare Ministry, page 190, written by Ellen G. White. Two words stand out as very important. The first is study how you can best help. Such a word denotes premeditated interest for those in our immediate sphere of influence. The second word is invite. This word takes us out of our comfort zone. It reminds us that building relationships with many people who may not know Christ requires time, patience, and most of all proximity. When we invite a neighbor to our house, our most intimate space, we must inspire trust and openness. Such behaviors often lower barriers with time will offer opportunities and conversations about Christ. One possible let us speak such opportunities to introduce people to Christ. And then right now I want to invite all the helpers to come up here so I can pray for the offering. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for giving this opportunity to gather here on this Sabbath morning. Uh, I just want to ask you to bless this offering right now that is going to be collected and be with the speaker that is going to be giving us a sermon. Uh, let us uh, resonate with us in our hearts. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. time for the children's story my favorite time of the ch of the whole church service do you guys normally come down front or you just come from where you are we come down front it, the the benches are a little damp so you guys are all comfortable and dry and why don't you just stay right where you are and i will tell the story from here uh you can come down if you want it's okay yeah you have you would love to have you down but if if you're on, on a dry spot just stay where you are there we go. Now I can move. Oh, this is good. I am so excited that you're here. Um, we've been all summer long with almost no kids at camp. And, oh, good, you're bringing down the offering. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for, for helping with that. Thank you so much. We've been missing kids at camp, so having you guys here is really, really special. Thanks for bringing the offering down. Look, they've even got a dry blanket down here for you. Wonderful. There's always room for one more. There we go. Oh, good. Thanks for coming down. And for those of you who are still sitting out there, you can listen in too. Um, I love camp, and I love it when, when kids are here. And so this summer has been, been hard because we've gone all summer with no kids. And uh, so thanks for being here. It was quite a few summers ago. Um, we had a young man coming to camp. It was his very first time. He was so excited to be at camp. His name 
oddly enough, was Chase. That was his name. Very fitting name for what came next that week. Um, Chase was so excited to be at camp. He wanted to do everything and he wanted to see everything. And he didn't like that he had to follow his cabin mates around all the time. And, and he always had to be with his counselor because he would be walking down the trail and he'd see something that would interest him and he'd kind of wander off, you know. And, and the counselor would look around and, where's Chase? He's gone. And then they would chase after him. That's why it was a very fitting name because we spent all week chasing after Chase. Every time his counselor, Jeremy, would, would look, Chase is gone. And he would wander off. And so then he would sit down with Chase and say, Chase, I know you love camp. But when we go from one place to the next, you've got to stay with the group. You have to walk with everybody. Oh, but there's so many interesting things, Chase said. And I'm so excited to get to the next activity. He said, but you've got to wait. You've got to be patient. And so they would be heading to the, from challenge course up to the horse barn. And they would they'd get all done. They would get everyone together. And they all walk in a line. And off they'd go. And, and Chase would, he'd see an interesting flower or, or maybe some other little trail he wanted to explore. And off he went. And the counselor would chase after him. And so the counselor talked with him. It didn't seem to work. And then the next person who had to talk to Chase was the boys' director. And the boys' director said, Chase, you can't run away. You can't go off in the woods on your own. You've got to stay with the group. And, and Chase would try so hard to do it, but he, he just couldn't. He always was running off. And every time his counselor, Jeremy, looked around, Chase was gone. And so he began to have Chase sit, stand or sit or walk right next to him and he have his arm around him. And that helped a little bit, but you know, then they were walking their trail and someone else would say, oh, Jeremy, I need I, my shoes untied. Can you help me tie my shoe? And so he'd bend down to, to help tie the other camper's shoe and he'd look around and Chase is gone again. Well, all week long, this went on. And, and Jeremy talked to them about it. The guy's director talked to them about it. The camp director had talked to them about it, and nothing seemed to change. And by the end of the week, it was Friday now, and the poor counselor was just tired. He was sick of chasing him everywhere. He wanted Chase just to stay where he was supposed to be, but he just couldn't do it. So finally it came to Friday night. And Friday nights at camp are really special because we have a really great program, and it always tells the story of Jesus. And this story, they were talking about how Jesus came and died for us. And it was going to be a really great program. And, and Jeremy thought, oh, if only Chase would just sit still. If, if only he would not run off. Maybe we could have a, a quiet program for a change. And so Jeremy made sure that everybody went to the restroom and got a drink before they went to campfire. And they came and they sat down and Jeremy put Chase right next to him, put his arm around him, make sure he stayed really close. And the program began. They began to tell the story of Jesus coming as a baby, living, and, and then eventually dying on the cross. And as they got to the point where Jesus was dying for us, Chase got really, really quiet. And he sat really, really still. And Jeremy thought, at last, finally, he's not running off. He's not being distracted. He's staying right where he wants him to be. And, and Chase just was listening to the story, wrapped up in the story. He loved it so much. And Jeremy was just, oh, finally, he could rest. He could just relax for a few moments. The program ended, and he thought, oh, maybe, maybe this evening will go better. Maybe finally Jeremy's learned he's got to stay where he's at. And so J uh, Chase will, will stay where he's at. So Jeremy got everyone together. He was getting everyone's with their, they're picking up their blankets that they were sitting on and getting their jackets and making sure their water bottles were picked up, and they're getting ready to go back to the cabin. And as he was doing all those things, he turned around, and guess who was gone? Chase was gone. Like, where did he go? He was just right here. He was sitting so quietly. Why couldn't he just stay where he belonged? Jeremy thought. And he began to look and began to search. And, and then he saw Chase. Chase had wandered off, but guess where he went? See, during the program, they had put up a big cross. as they talked about what Jesus did. And Jeremy had wandered off. And he was kneeling at the foot of the cross, giving his life to Jesus. I don't know about you, but if you're going to wander off somewhere, if you're going to, to go somewhere, um, you know, uh, 
outside, away from the group, there's no better place to go. There's no better place to run away to than to Jesus. And Jesus, more than anything else, wants you to follow him. To not wander off anywhere else, but to follow him wherever he goes. In fact, Jesus tells us in the Bible that when we get to heaven, we're going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Jesus doesn't have to chase us anymore. But in this world, you know what Jesus does for each one of us? Jesus chases after you. No matter where you go, no matter how uh, far you may wander, Jesus is always there looking for you, chasing after you, because he wants you to come and be his friend. He wants you to come and follow him. So do yourself a favor and stop running. Stop running away from Jesus and start following him and see how your life will change. We've got more stories to tell, but this is the end of your story. You can find your way back to your seats. If you've got a little more offering, you can put it in over there in the box. And thanks so much for being here at Sunset Lake. Very good. You got your hand sanitizer and everything. It's awesome. Well, it's really good to be here. Um, and I, I wish that I had the gift of tongues today, but my Ukrainian is uh, zero. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dobri dang. All right. Did I say it right? She's helped me out up here. Uh, but she won't be able to be here to give me all the words, but hopefully the, the earpieces will work well and, and you'll be able to, to follow along. Thank you for choosing to, to be out here with you. Um, we have been uh, it, just privileged to have Eric helping us all summer long. He helped last summer as well, uh, putting together all of our virtual campfires. Um, we could not have done what we did without his help, so we're, we're really grateful that he's uh, on loan uh, to us for, for the summer and every Tuesday he came out and did our did filming and, and so it was a lot of fun. Thanks Eric for that. I um it was my it was two years ago and I was coming to camp, um, getting ready and all the staff were arriving and my program director who was in charge of all the evening programs, he um he had a little slip of paper that he was handing out to everybody, finding out what they wanted to do to help with the program. Do you want to be in the play? Do you have musical talent? Whatever it might be. And I made the mistake when I got my sheet, because I was just trying to be nice, I guess. I made the mistake of writing on the sheet, whatever you need. That was what I wrote. I'll do whatever you need. Handed it in. He came back to me the next day and he said, I got your sheet. You said you'd be willing to do whatever I need. I need you and your wife to be in the evening play. I said, great, I, we can do that. That's no problem. He said, but you remember the scene in the play where there's this party going on and, and there, there's supposed to be some groups uh, doing, a, doing some dancing? I began to sweat. Yeah, I remember that part in the play. I'm the one that wrote it. Um, he said, we, we need you and your wife to, to come in and do some dancing. We're going to just do a simple waltz, nothing, nothing hard. I said, I don't. I don't dance. I, I grew up in a good Adventist preacher's home. I, I, my feet don't move that way. I can't, I can't do that, I said. No, he said, it'll be great. It'll be really easy. We've got someone coming in that's going to teach you how to do it. You and your wife will do fine. I said, all right. I said, whatever. So I guess I will. So I remember the first rehearsal. We got out to, um, to Cedar Island and, and we're out there. And, and uh, Joy, who is the, the, the teacher helping us to learn, she said, it's really simple, and, and she showed us how the, how the feet are going to move. She showed what we need to do, and she said, now the, the man needs to lead, she said. So I thought, okay, I'm going to lead. You got to, you know, your, your arms got to be, got to be stiff enough. You got to show your partner where to move, and, and, and your partner follows. You're the leader, she said to me. So okay, and, and I, I tried to, to move my feet like she moved and tried to make it in time of the music, and I was stepping on my wife's toes. I was all over the place. It was a mess. I couldn't lead to save my life because I didn't know how to dance. Finally, Joy came over and she said, let me show you. And she had my wife step aside. She stepped in. She said, I'll lead. You follow. I said, okay. 
And as I began to follow what Joy was doing, all of a sudden, I began to catch on. You know, it's hard to lead when you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but when there's someone there to guide you, there's someone there who's showing you the way, when you have the ability to follow, it's so much easier. Now, I can't tell you that I'm really good at doing the waltz, um, but we got through it. We did okay, and uh, we, we survived the summer. But I learned something in that first rehearsal. I learned the importance of following. In today's world, we hear a lot about leadership. We need more leaders, they'll tell us. We need, we need people to step up and do great things for God. And, and we, we go to seminars on leadership, and we, we uh, go to classes on leadership, and we read books on leadership. But Jesus comes to us and says, follow me. In fact, the very first words that he said to his disciples were, follow me. The very first words that he said to Peter were, follow me. In fact, the very last words that Jesus said to Peter were, follow me. And I'm wondering today what would happen if we took Jesus seriously. So I have been on a journey over the last couple of years. Um, I have been giving up on leadership. And I've decided just to follow Jesus. I've decided to spend my life being his disciple. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about what it means to follow, uh, what it means to, to assume the posture of discipleship. What does it look like? How does it operate in our lives? And what difference could it make if we truly follow this? So let's pray and invite God to be with us as we, we enter into his word. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that we can be here in this special place, that uh, we can sit in your presence today, we can learn from you, we can hear your voice. And Lord Jesus, there's nothing more that we want to do than to follow you. So come and walk with us today. Uh, be the leader of our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three postures of leadership that we want to talk about today um, and we want to talk about what they, what they could look like in your life the per the first posture is posture of surrender we live in a world that that's all about grabbing and and holding on and taking what you can get and Jesus says no the, the real posture of a disciple of a follower is a posture of surrender not hanging on to things, but surrendering things, giving up things. When I came to Washington 16 years ago, I, I came to be the, the youth director of the conference and the camp director of the conference, and I, had all, I wore all the hats. I was Pathfinder director, I was youth director, I was young adult director, I was camp director, I was a whole bunch of things all at once. And so I was always in charge. Um, I was always the leader at camp. So if, if Pathfinders came to do an event here, I was the Pathfinder director. I was in charge. I was the one up front. I was the one planning the program. But then uh, several years ago, we decided that it would be helpful to have two people in the youth department. And one person would take Pathfinders and youth, and then I would stay with camp and young adults. And so David Salazar, if some of you may know David, David came in to be the youth director and Pathfinder director. And I came out and began to live here at camp. And during that time, we were going through some staff changes and it was just my wife and I out here at camp. And I'll never forget the first Pathfinder Camp Reeves. So it was the first event after this change had happened. And Everybody came, and I was used to being up front. I was used to being the one in charge and telling everybody what to do and, and uh, having all the, the kids come up to me. But at this retreat, my job was to be the host for the event. My job was to um, set up chairs and to clean the bathrooms and uh, sweep the floors 
and to make sure everything was running smoothly. And so I went from being in charge to cleaning toilets. Now, that seems like a, a pretty hard transition. But, you know, I, I found a certain joy in serving, giving up on, on all the titles and just serving people. And over the, the years since, I've, I've had so many opportunities to serve people. I had a couple that, that came in for a retreat, and, and they, they showed up Friday night, and, and they came over to, to the gym where I was, and they said, we got in our room, and we noticed that the bathroom wasn't clean. We're looking for some cleaning supplies so that we can clean our bathroom. And, and I said, I said, that's not your job. That's my job. And I said, I'm so sorry your, your, your bathroom wasn't clean enough for you. Um, I'll go get the cleaning materials, and I'll go clean your toilet. Really? Yes, I'll clean your toilet. Something happened to me there as I was scrubbing their toilet. I began to understand the life of Jesus who continually laid his life down and served other people. Um, look at the life of Jesus and what he does. Jesus, and in fact, if you want to take your Bibles, um, I said, here's my phone, this is my pocket. Um, Philippians chapter 2 is a great verse like to, uh, this is sort of like the uh, scriptural limbo, uh, how low can you go kind of thing, you know, and, and, and Jesus, um, he's equal with God, he is God, he's, he's um, living with all, all the power of the universe at his fingertips, and verse 6, as though he was God, he did not think, equal, he did not think of equality with God, something to cling to, instead he gave up his divine privileges, and he took the humble position of a slave. And we see Jesus coming. He lived, uh, he, he was born in a manger, in a food trough. Um, and you think, wow, I mean, how much lower can you go? And yet Jesus' entire life was about continually submitting himself in service to God. At the beginning of his ministry, he goes to John, John the Baptist there at the River Jordan. And he says, I want to be baptized. Now, the baptism that John was doing was, was a sinner's baptism. It was a baptism of repentance. And if anyone didn't need repentance, it was Jesus. And yet Jesus says, I want to be baptized by you. And John says, well, I'm not worthy. He said, no, it needs to be done. And so Jesus submits himself to the, the, the sinner's baptism. And you know the story as he comes up out of the water. Heaven is opened. Scripture says, and, and God comes down in the form of a dove and says, this is my son. And that word for heaven being opened isn't just like a door opening. It's something being ripped open. Heaven is ripped open as Jesus submits himself, as surrenders himself. The same thing happens at the end of his life. John says that Jesus' hour, his moment of glory, his, his time was when he hung on the cross. And as Jesus hangs on the cross and surrenders his life for you and I, as he breathes his last, once again something is torn, right? That dividing curtain between the presence of God and man is ripped open. And there's no, now no division between heaven and earth. The same thing happens in the life of Stephen. Stephen comes before the Sanhedrin and he calls the nation of Israel into account for the death of Messiah. He, he calls them into judgment. And the, the, the Sanhedrin knows exactly what he's doing, and they're furious. And, and at the end of his, of his sermon, Stephen looks up, and he sees heaven open. Once again, heaven rips open. And he says, I see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God. And of course, they're, they're angry, they're furious. They haul him out, and they stone him to death. Every time someone surrenders, the dividing wall between heaven and earth is torn. S surrender is the power posture in the kingdom of God. It's the superhero posture. It, being a superhero in the kingdom of God isn't rushing in and saving the day. It's giving your life for others, surrendering your life. Do you want to be a follower of Jesus today? Do you want to be his disciple? Instead of clinging to things. Let it go. Say to Jesus, my life is not my own. It belongs to you. You can have it. It's yours. Surrender. That's the first posture 
of discipleship, the first posture of following Jesus. The second one um, is the posture of generosity. Um, generosity is, is such a, a, an interesting posture. One of my favorite authors, his name is Bob Goff. Bob Goff goes all over the country speaking, and he's written like three books. And um, at the back of every one of his books is his cell phone number. It's not a fake cell phone number. It's his real cell phone number. Uh, and in fact, if, if you get one of his books and call the number, he'll answer. He answers every single cell phone call. Not his secretary, not somebody else in his office. He answers it. And why? Because he wants to be available. That's a posture of generosity. And, and it's amazing what Bob has had happen. He's gotten all kinds of crazy calls from people. He's gotten collect calls from prison. Uh, some guy from prison wanted to, uh, to uh, figure out how he could get a hold of his girlfriend who was trying to break up with him. And he got in the middle of all of that. And one time there was a college student that accidentally backed up into someone's car. And, and she was a poor college student. She couldn't afford to buy this guy a new bumper and so she said, what am I going to do? And, and she saw Bob's go Bob Goff's book in the back of her car. And she thought, his cell phone number is in, the, in there. And so instead of, she wrote a little note, so sorry, I backed into your car, uh, call me. And she put Bob Goff's phone number uh, on the card. And so Bob's there in San Diego, gets a call from some angry guy in Texas. Why would you back into my car? And, and Bob did the only thing he knew to do. He bought the guy a new bumper. It's expensive sometimes to be available, to, to always make yourself uh, available. I, I've never written a book, so I can't put my cell phone number in the back of a book. Um, but I have chosen to make myself available. I've decided it, over the last couple of years that I'm going to do something, something that's called unconditional positive regard big fancy words, which means no matter what someone says to me, no matter how they treat me, no matter what's going on, I will always think well of them. I will always think positively of them. It's been amazing what that kind of openness and availability has done. I'll never forget one, one uh, day during the week here at camp, I came up to the dining hall and there was a counselor out on the, on the porch of the dining hall and he was mad. You could see he was mad. It was written all over his face. He came up to me and said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with, 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 with Carl here. He's just, he won't listen to me. He won't, he won't do what I'm asking him to do. And, and Carl's sitting there and his arms are crossed and he's mad too. He's like, oh, this is not going anywhere good, you know. So I, I said to the counselor, I said, look, you go in and, and you sit down with the rest of your campers and I'll take care of Carl. So I said, hey, Carl, can I talk to you? No. I said, Carl, don't worry about it. You're not in trouble. I just want to get to know you a little better. Okay. And so we went and we sat down at a picnic table out in front of the dining hall. And I said to Carl, how's your week going? It took him a little bit, but he began to tell me about his week and all the fun he was having. And, and then I started talking about what, what, what his interests were, what he liked. Somewhere along in the conversation, he told me that he liked Legos. I said, you like Legos? I like Legos too. And, and, and I said, what, what, kind of, what kind of sets do you have? And, and I said, you know, when I, when I had Legos, all I had were like the blocks and none of the fancy stuff they've got now. I said, yeah, have you ever done like one of those big Star Wars ones? You know, or what, you know, what, what, and he started talking about Legos and we're having all this fun. And, and pretty soon he forgot all about being angry. He forgot all about that I was a director and I, I might, you might be in trouble. We just had this conversation. And, and when it was all done, I said, Carl, I said, I really like you. You're an amazing person. Really? Yeah. And, and, and it got, I said, you know, I guess maybe you can go back to your, your cabin now. And he gets up to go. I said, oh, Carl, one more thing. I said, hey, could you do me a favor? Yeah, whatever you need. I said, could you listen to your counselor and do what he's asking you to do? Oh, yeah, sure. He said, and off he went. And, and as, he, as he walked away, he turned around and he said, you're really nice. He turned around and walked away. And I, we never had any more trouble with Carl. 
I made myself available to him. And, and, and God worked through that availability. The posture of generosity says everything I receive from God, everything I, I get from him, I freely give to others. Jesus models this in his ministry over and over again. I love what Jesus does uh, at Peter's house. You know, he comes in, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, and, and then it says that that evening, so it was Sabbath evening now, the sun's going down, the entire village shows up at, at Peter's house. They're all there. Everybody in town who's sick is all there. And Jesus is probably tired and he's probably ready just to go to bed. But Jesus makes himself available and he cures every single person that comes to the door. Can you imagine? There's nobody sick in the entire town. There's nobody that has any diseases in the entire town. They've all been healed by Jesus. He makes himself available. And Jesus is tired, and, and he goes off over the Sea of Galilee by boat just to get away from the crowds for a little bit, to, to rest and relax, and someone figures out where he's going. And they follow him, some by boat, some around the lake shore. And so when he shows up to get away and, and to have a retreat, there are 5,000 people lining the shores. And Jesus could have sent them all away. But Jesus makes himself available because he's generous. And he says, sit down, let's talk. And he preaches, tells them stories. And then when, when it's supper time, he says, well, we've got to feed him. So he finds the little boy's lunch, you know, and he feeds the 5,000. That's Jesus being generous with his life, generous with his time, generous with who he is. And Jesus says, do you want to follow me? You need to be generous. Everything you receive from me, every gift you have, everything that you get from me, it's not for you to hang on to. It's not for you to keep. It's for you to give away. What would it look like if your life was more about giving away than keeping? That's what following Jesus is all about. So the third posture. The third posture of discipleship is the posture of mission. Um, the posture of mission says, where are the needs in the world? Where are the people that are hurting? Where are the broken places in our world? Where are the, are the deep needs? And that's where I want to be. I want to be in the middle of, of where things are hurting and broken and, and in pain. I want to be right there in the middle of it, and I want to be there to, to make myself available in any way I can to solve the problem. One of my favorite times in, in the life of, of camp is when I get to interview potential staff members. And I, I go to all these different colleges all around the country, and I meet some incredible people. It's fun to talk to them. You'll say, why do you want to work at camp? And they'll say, well, I've I really need a summer job, you know, and uh, or well, uh, my friends are saying, and I thought maybe a fun way to spend the summer, or or I, I love outdoors, so that's gonna be fun. Once in a while, you'll 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 meet someone who'll say, oh, I just love kids, and I want to be there to serve them. But oftentimes, it's just I need a job, I, I need this, and so you you interview all these, people, and you hire your staff of eighty-five people. So here. During staff, we, all these staff members come in. They're just here to work. They're just here to get a job. And, and we get to tell them, you know what? You're here for more than just money. You're here for more than just having fun. You're here to change lives. And then the campers show up. And with the, as the campers show up, these staff members who, who thought they were just getting a summer job all of a sudden realize that this is so much more. Because they get to see their, their campers. And these, these campers are... Some of them are hurting and they're, and they're broken and they have struggles in their life. And, and they'll sit down with these staff members and say, here's what's going on in my world and I don't know what to do. And, and the, the counselor come to me and say, well, my camper just told me about what's going on in their home. What, what do I say to them? How do I do this? How do I, you know, and then they'll have the opportunity to, to actually lead one of their campers to Jesus. I've had so many counselors come to me and say, you'll never guess what happened. You know, I, I, just, I just led someone to Jesus or I just helped someone say their very first prayer. And it changes their life. I remember a moment uh, of mission uh, that I saw happen. There was a young teen, teen camper. He came from a really rough background, inner city, um, home life, 
was probably a disaster from what I could gather. Um, and out of his brokenness, he he was angry and he he didn't know how to treat people well. And he didn't, particularly he didn't know how to treat women very well. Clearly they had never been modeled to him. And there was one of our staff members that was helping to teach the basketball class that summer. And he didn't respect her. And it started out with him just being rude. And as the week progressed, it, it, it moved on in, into things a lot more serious until the, the conversations and, and the things that was going on were to a point where it, it went into harassment. And so we had to, to sit him down and say, look, because we, we had talked to them all through the week. So we finally hit that point where we said, you know what, we can't do this. We've got to protect our campers, other campers. We've got to protect our staff members. We can't allow this to happen. So I, now sitting down at, at a picnic table, myself and the guys director is on one side of the picnic table, and this camper and his counselor are on the other side. And I, I said to this young man, I said, you know, we, we've been talking about this. You know where this is heading. Um, I, we really love having you here, and uh, we really want you here, but boy, your behavior is telling me that, that you don't want to be here. And he interrupted me. He said, I know what you're going to do. He said, so, so just stop talking already and send me home. Because I, I know you don't care about me, so just send me home. That's what he said. So now I, I, I come back around and I say, look, we care about you. That's why we're sitting down and having this conversation. And I, I tried every way I knew how to let this young man know that I truly cared for him. But he just shut down. He stopped talking. He looked out into the woods. He wouldn't look at me. He wouldn't talk to me. Shut down. You know, I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to get through to this young man. And then his counselor spoke up. And his counselor looked at this young man and he said, I know what it's like to have the people who are supposed to be caring for you, the people who are closest to you, turn their back on you and not care for you and not be there for you. I know what it's like. And then he began to tell this young man the story of his life. His parents um, were, were alcoholics. alcoholics. They... Um, they lived their lives incredibly irresponsible. This young man spent a good share of his early childhood homeless, living off the streets, living in an incredibly rough environment. He said, I know what it's like to be abandoned, to have no one care for you. He said, but you've got to know. You've got to know that, that I care for you. And at this point, his counselor, Caleb, begins, begins to cry. He said, you've got to know, I, I love you, I care for you. I want the best for you. And as I, I watched Caleb step into this moment, I, I sensed that I was in the presence of Jesus. I, I, I had no way to reach this young man, but Caleb, through the telling of his story, through his acts of compassion throughout the week, stepped into this moment. He said, God, there, there's, a, there's a young man that needs me. And I, I want to be there in the midst of it. And he just opened his life up to him. And the only thing that this young boy said, the, almost the whole time that, I, that we were there, he turned to Caleb after Caleb said, I care for you. He turned to him and with tears in his eyes said, I know. I know you do. And that was all. I, I wish we could have kept him at camp, but of course we, we, we had gotten to that point where he had to send him home but there was that moment where Caleb stepped into the need and said God use me make a difference through me and it changed Caleb uh, to be able to, to impact that camper in that way and, and Caleb actually still comes back to camp at least once a summer uh, to help volunteer he's particularly interested in our blind campers uh, and every every summer pours his life out into these these kids um, he understands the posture of mission. The posture of mission says, where are the deep needs? Where are the hurt? Where is the brokenness? God, here am I. Send me. Three postures of discipleship. Three postures of what it looks like to follow Jesus. The first is a posture of surrender. 
Second, posture of generosity. Finally, the posture of mission. Now, I, I wanted to put this together for you. And I want you to experience something with me. One of the things that we've been doing this summer, we, haven't done, we don't do it every day, but um, we started out doing it more regularly, and now we're, we're exploring other avenues of prayer. But there is a prayer that we've been claiming and referring to all summer long here at camp with our staff. And we call it a posture prayer. And it's a, it's a prayer that involves, um, involves all of us. And it's not just a prayer that you, you say, but it involves your, your body as well. Think of this as your, your chiropractic adjustment today, uh, your spiritual chiropractic adjustment. So we're going we're gonna to move a little bit. We're going to assume some postures today. And um, I don't know how well it will work for those of you that are listening on earpieces. You may have a hard time doing a, a prayer that repeats after me. But for those of you that can, you can... Uh, you can follow along. So what I'll do is I will, um, we'll read this, I'll, I'll, I'll say the phrases, and then you can uh, repeat after me. We'll keep it really simple. But along the way, we're going to assume some postures. So I'll, let me show them to you so that you'll, you'll know what it looks like. When we talk about the, the, the posture of surrender, we begin with our, our, our fists clenched in front of us. That's how often we, we, we come to God with our fists clenched. And God says, if you just open up your life, surrender it to me, there's so much more I can do for you. And so we begin with our fists clenched, and then eventually we, we open our hands. Um, that's the first posture. The second posture, which is the posture of generosity, begins with my fists closed this way and then turned open uh, this way at the end. Um, the last one, which is the posture mission, begins with your arms crossed. This is the, a posture of I don't care, and it doesn't involve me, and it's not my problem. Um, and it ends with the posture mission, which is the open arms of, of Christ. So we'll, we'll um, take some time along the way. We'll also in this prayer, we're going to give you a moment. As we talk about generosity, we talk about all the things that we receive from God that we in turn can give to others. There'll be a moment in this prayer where we'll, we'll give you some time quietly in your own heart and mind to ask God for what you need today. So be ready, be thinking about that, and, and then we'll commit together to not just receiving it, but giving it as well. So this is a, a prayer I hope that will become maybe a part of the rhythm of your life and something that will uh, help you in your journey of following Jesus. So... Um, Let's, let's try this together. And I think you can do it just sitting where you are. Um, and again, you can just simply repeat after me. We're going to begin with our, our fists clenched like this. So there you go. You can put your hands up. Awesome. And repeat after me. I confess my natural human posture is to fight for my rights, to try to make something happen. But I choose as a follower of Jesus a posture of surrender. You lift your hands. My life is not my own. It belongs to you, God. And you can have it. Now take your fists and clench them in front of you like this. I confess my natural human posture. is to take, is to keep, is to hold. But I choose as a follower of Jesus to open my hands and my life in a posture of generosity. Freely I receive. And take a moment now. Take a moment now to ask God for what you need to receive from him at this moment. Quietly in your, in your own heart, to take a moment to ask for what you need.
Now repeat after me. Everything I receive today, I freely give. Now fold your arms over your chest. I confess my natural human posture is to spectate, is to criticize, is to say, it's not my problem. But I choose as a follower of Jesus an open posture of mission. I say to the lost, I say to the deep needs of the world, here I am. Send me. Amen. Today we have chosen to live as disciples, to live as followers. What a difference we can make in our world if we quit trying to lead and started following Jesus. Those disciples who were told to follow him went out into the world as followers. And, and scripture says they turned the world upside down just by following. This world is in desperate need of followers today. Desperate need of people who've surrendered their life to Jesus. Desperately need people who, who are simply conduits of all the resources of heaven, sharing everything we receive from God. And this world is in desperate need of people who look for the hurt, who look for the brokenness, who look for the great needs and say, that's where I want to be, that's where I want to live. So I challenge you today to be a follower. Um, and to spend your life following Jesus and move on into eternity, as, as Revelation says, spending eternity following the Lamb wherever he goes. That's our calling in life. Not to, to lead and do great things and, and, and start big corporations. Jesus doesn't ask us to do any of that. He just says to you, follow me. And I pray today that you will answer his call. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for praying with me today, that posture prayer. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do through you as you follow him. I just want to thank uh, Pastor Dave for a great sermon and uh, for such a great um great sermon of an inspiration for all of us today. Um, I think it, we really need it as, as a church. And um, may God bless you, and may God bless this camp and all you do for the, for the little kids uh, and for uh, older kids as well. Um, and for that, you know, I, I just i am amazed at what kind of impact you have on, on, uh, on youth and on younger kids in their spiritual life as they grow up and uh, so it's amazing um